Welcome to the Friday Happy Hour with Victory Strategist, award-winning author and your Happy Hour host, Anne-Marie Kelly. Each week, Anne-Marie chats with women who have reinvented, started over or wrote fabulous next chapters. They share how they overcame their midlife challenges and how you can too. So kick back with some good happy hour something to drink and enjoy today's show. Welcome, you're listening to the Friday Happy Hour with me and Marie Kelly. I'm that recovering good girl and your victorious woman empowerment partner. And this is where us victory chicks and you men who care about us meet on Fridays to chat about the things we can do to achieve our goals, overcome challenges, and get empowered so our lives can sparkle. Thanks for joining me today at Happy Hour. And listen, talk about making our lives sparkle. Today's guest is a good one for sparkle tips. She's broadcasting happiness author Michelle Gillen. Michelle shifted her job from the CBS morning show, so some of you might remember her from there. But she shifted it into the happiness arena. Her story is pretty interesting, and I'm going to ask her a little bit about it when she gets here. And say that, so she'll be here in a couple minutes. And it spreaks just a month away. I'm walking into the to the station today, and people are in shorts and flip flops. And Mother Nature must be ha- must must be in menopause because she's having her own private spring this week, and we're all liking her hot flashes, aren't we? I, I know February always gives us like a little spring teaser, but shorts, t-shirts, flip flops, flip flops in February, and some of the flowers are a little confused. And, like, can't you almost hear them asking each other, is it time? It seems earlier than usual. What what do you think? Somebody should poke their head out and say, ask the crocus to do it. He always likes to be first. And can you picture the mom tulips going crazy because the baby tulips want some fresh air? And they're afraid they'll poke their, and, and the mom tulips are afraid they'll poke their little heads out before it's time. Okay, maybe you don't dialogue with the flowers, but I don't do it all the time. But sometimes when I'm walking alone, that's how I amuse myself. Sad, huh? But all too true. But, you know, there's a spiritual philosophy that says there's life in everything. And if you ever talk to your flowers or played music for them, like your, you know, your houseplants, you know they respond and they grow bigger. And and this year, I'm so excited. For the very first time, I grew basil indoors and just with natural light. I've tried for years, but this year, I actually have it growing. And some of those basil leaves, leaves smile at me when I'm at the sink, pouring myself a glass of water. And, of course, I smile back and give them some little pray, a little bit of praise, a little gratitude. They like it. I know, you think I'm certifiable, but not really. So I'm not complaining about the nice weather. I, I just don't want to have to pay for it with a huge snowstorm on March 21st. And listen, speaking of Mother Nature, what did you think of NASA's announcement that they found a bunch of new planets? They're calling them TRAPPIST-1. And NASA's website says... Three of these planets are firmly located in the habitable zone. That means it's where there's water so they can sustain life. Now, if you're thinking about Star Wars and Star Trek, and if you're a Trekkie, this is like your wildest sci-fi fantasies coming to life. Me? I'm thinking about the people I personally would like to see take up residence on those planets. You know, the ones that don't broadcast happiness. I'll bet you know some people like that, and you'd like to see them travel to a TRAPPIST-1 planet, too, huh? Okay, I know it's unkind. Too bad. If you want to read more, I posted a link to NASA's story about this on today's radio wrap-up at victoriouswoman.com. 
And it includes an illustration of what somebody, I guess, thought the surface of one of those planets looked like. And you know what? It's the kind of place you might want to visit on a vacation. So check it out, victoriouswoman.com. And speaking of NASA, this Sunday is the Oscars. Now, I'm not a big fan of these shows, um, except for the Grammys. However, I usually like to watch the opening number. After that, I think the rest of it kind of just drags. But this year, I'm a little more interested because last weekend, I saw the movie Hidden Figures at the Colonial in Phoenixville. Have you seen that yet? It's fabulous. It's the story of three victorious black women who were brilliant mathematicians and, in 1961, in the middle of the Civil Rights Movement, served vital roles at NASA. Now, for most of us, we don't remember when things were like that, that there were colored bathrooms and white bathrooms and colored drinking fountains and white drinking fountains. So for me, it was sort of shocking to see that as well as some of the other aspects of segregation. Like like this one, one of the characters, Mary Jackson, she was fighting on two fronts because she was a woman who wanted to become an engineer, a black woman who wanted to become an engineer. Now, for starters, in 1961, it was thought that only men who were, were smart enough to be engineers. Now, frankly, I don't know if that's changed, at least according to one woman engineer who won the, 19, the 2016 Victorious Woman Contest. She'll tell, tell you that a lot of people still have that antiquated opinion. But that, was, that happened to be only one of Mary Jackson's fights. The other fight was because the classes were held in an all-white school. And she had to go to court to get permission to go to even just, that, just to enter that school to take the classes. You know, that seems so strange to us now, but that's how it was in 1961, and she did it. And another one of those women, Kara Thuringi Robinson, worked on Project Mercury and figured out the problem that, if she hadn't, might have resulted in the failure of John Glenn's orbit in space. Johnson worked in an all-male environment, which, if you, if you watched Mad Men, you know, in 1961, that would have been a challenge enough. But that brilliant woman had to walk a half mile just to get to the colored bathroom because in that building at NASA, there was no colored bathroom. You know, Victory Checks and you guys, I would not have lasted a day in that kind of environment, especially if they didn't set up a porta potty or, or uh, you know, unless they used the pens, which, like in 1961, I don't think they even existed. So... I would have been SOL, but not Katherine Johnson. So Hidden Figures was, was such a victorious woman-style empowerment movie, and Taraji B. Henson and Octavia Spencer and Janelle Monet did an amazing job. But here's, I was wondering, considering this is Black History Month and next week starts Women's History Month, I don't know why it didn't get more, that movie didn't get more publicity. But then this morning, I was surfing around the, the morning shows, and all they seemed to talk about was La La Land for Best Picture, Best Actor, Actress. I was scratching my head. La La Land wasn't bad, but it didn't have, it didn't live up, to, in my opinion, didn't live up to the height. Personally, I thought there was no chemistry between Emma Stone and Ryan Gosling. So to me, their story wasn't even believable. Not so with Hidden Figures. I thought the story was amazing, and, in my opinion, it was a flawless movie. And I almost, I almost never say that, but sometimes I laughed, other times I cried, I cringed. And I was in awe of what those women did, in spite of the odds. Then, at the end, like everybody else, I clapped. So if you haven't seen it, don't miss it before it goes away from the big screen, or get it as soon as it's available at home, which should be late spring. Hidden Figures is one of those movies that I would buy and watch every once in a while, Just and I will buy it, just for the women's empowerment boost. And, uh, you know, I know it's uh, – uh, what I'm hoping this Sunday is that it's the Oscars upset picture. You know, the one that nobody thought would win, and then it did. That's mostly the only interest they have in the Oscars this year. 
Oh, but wait, I forgot to tell you, the, the woman who did the research on the Hidden Figures women, who wrote the book, uh, she's author of Margot Lee Shetterly, she's coming to our happy hour in the fall. I, I tried to get her for next month for Women's History Month, but she's book solid. So her publicist and I are working on that fall date. And, and while I'm talking about the movies, I read something in last Sunday's paper about Judy Dench. I think she's amazing. If you're a James Bond fan, you know her as M, the head of the 007 Secrets Intelligence Service or whatever it was called. More recently, you might have seen her in the Best Exotic Marigold Hotel movies. Anyway, Judy Dench has a new movie opening today. It's called Tulip Fever, and she plays an abbess in 17th century Amsterdam. But here's the thing. Judy Dench is 82 years old, and she doesn't seem to be slowing down at all. So this week, as I was reading Broadcasting Happiness by our guest today, Michelle Gillen, I got, it got me wondering about Judy Dench and what kind of broadcasting mindset she must have. So I'm going to ask Michelle about that. And here's why I invited Michelle Gellin to join us for Happy Hour. In addition to being a national CBS news anchor turned positive psychology researcher, Michelle has been a featured professor on Oprah Winfrey's happiness course, and with her spouse, Shauna Aker, she produced the happiness advantage on PBS. So you might know her from any one of those things. And today she's here to talk with us and sharing some of her broadcasting happiness tips. So listen, go get some happy hour, some good, some good happy hour, something to drink, and come back when I'm broadcasting happiness with Michelle Gellin. You're listening to the Friday Happy Hour. Remember when you wished you had more time for yourself, and now you have it, but you notice you're keeping busy with stuff, but that stuff isn't making you feel happy or filled up. And when you think about what would make you happy and filled up, you get stuck or feel overwhelmed. And then you go back to what's more familiar, more comfortable, even if it's not making you happy. Wouldn't you love to find a way to start making sense of that deep discontent you're feeling? Well, you're not alone. I'm Anne Marie Kelly, author, victory strategist, and the radio show host of the Friday Happy Hour. And I know there's a place for you, one that other women have found to be both inspirational and empowering. And it's the Victorious Woman Project. Go there now and get on my mailing list where you'll be the first to know about my upcoming online workshops, teleseminars, and more. And while you're there, take a couple minutes to look over my blog. You can download some of the free stuff I have for you and let it get your creative juices going. I'm looking forward to meeting you at the Victorious Woman Project. And that's at www.victoriouswoman.com. Welcome back to the Friday Happy Hour. I'm your host, Anne-Marie Kelly, and with me is best-selling author of Broadcasting Happiness, Michelle Gillen. Greetings, Michelle. Oh, I'm so happy to be here with you. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, I'm glad that you're here. You know, Michelle, I, uh, when I was reading Broadcasting Happiness, I thought you were living the life of your dreams as a national morning news anchor on CBS. But in 2008, you gave it up for something you were even more passionate about. Will you tell my listeners what happened that got you on that positivity path? Yeah, absolutely. So my friends, when I decided to quit my job at CBS, thought I was a little crazy. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, but uh, it was the right decision for me. What had happened was I'd worked very hard to get that role. I was working um, you know, in the early morning hours, anchoring two national news programs. Uh, but the problem was that I felt as if the news we were reporting on was very, very negative, as many people complain about, you know, about the news right. in general. Uh, and, uh, but what was, what I was more interested in was not just how negative it is and how it affects us, but how we can actually talk about negative situations on the news, around the dinner table, in our businesses, with our kids, in a way that leaves us feeling empowered, inspired, and ready to take positive action. Um, and a lot of this interest came out of an experience that I had while there, which was we um, at the height of the recession when we were reporting on people losing their homes and their jobs and their retirement savings, we said, you know what, we're going to change the story here. Yes, we'll talk about problems, but for one week, every time we discuss a problem, we're going to bring in an expert to talk about a solution. And we got the greatest viewer response to what we called Happy Week. Um, and But more importantly, I, I feel as if people took the information 
made incredible changes in their lives, and then wrote in to tell us about these stories. Uh, and to me, that was so inspiring. And so I could After see just one week, that, right? It was just, you yeah. just for one week. Yeah, it was incredible. It was just one week. Um, and the majority of the experts were from the field of positive psychology, which I had never heard about previously and then was incredibly interested in. And so, so you left CBS, and then you just did, you didn't just like dabble in positivity. You went all in. What did you do next? <laughs> I did. Uh, I so after leaving CBS, I went and got a master's in positive psychology at the University of Pennsylvania, which is the place where Dr. Martin Seligman, the founder of the field, founded that program. And the idea was to uh, empower professionals from all different backgrounds and fields to be able to use this science of happiness and human potential in whatever discipline they worked in. And so my intention was to understand more about how to report on stories in a a more empowering way and then potentially return to media, except now I um, am so... Uh, attracted to and uh, the research that we're doing. I, you know, I'm a researcher now and uh, working at companies and organizations and looking at how when we change our story, we change our power to influence our life, our trajectory, and the lives of the people around us. So as part of that, and as a happiness researcher, I love that you're a happiness researcher. I think that's such a fun thing. <laughs> Yeah, you know, um, it's it's funny because if you, at first people look at me and they don't know if I'm kidding or what I'm talking about. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, but when I explain, you know, about really what this entails, then they they get it and then they're very interested in, in understanding more about the science. Mm. Um, the science is showing us in a very compelling way that when our brain is positive, it fuels every single business and educational outcome we know how to track. So basically, when we're more positive, We have, in one study, 31% higher levels of productive energy. We have, if you're, you know, working uh, in corporate America, you increase your chances of getting a a promotion over the next year by 40%. Uh, If you are feeling stressed, the negative effects of stress, like headaches, backaches, and fatigue, can have a decreased influence on your life. You feel 23% less of those symptoms if you're in that more positive zone. Mm. So, so as part of that, you believe, we, you know, with all the research you're doing, you really believe we can control our happiness by what you call broadcasting happiness. Now, first of all, what does that mean, broadcasting happiness? Well, the the ti- that's the title of my book, and it, it came out of a merging of two worlds, right, the broadcasting world and the happiness researcher world. But when we look at that in practical terms and how you use it, it's, um, it's more about uh, broadcasting to the people around you an empowered, resilient, optimistic, positive mindset, especially in the face of challenges. So what happened was I went to, this, to UPenn, and I'm, I'm studying there, and I'm thinking about the influence that – broadcasters and celebrities and professional athletes have to, you know, change the people around them for the better or for the worse. You know, there's always that side, too. Um, But then what happened was I had this epiphany about all of us, which is that no matter what our role in life is, we are all broadcasters. As we move throughout our day, we're constantly transmitting information to the people around us. And we're, we're incredibly influential over other people's moods and mindsets. Uh, when a challenge strikes, especially if we broadcast that empowered, optimistic, resilient mindset that says, I believe good things can happen. I, I believe my behavior matters. I think if we stay linked up and work on this challenge together, we can overcome it. That actually fuels success rates, and it makes everyone uh, stronger and better at whatever they're doing. You know, I, I've had those experiences with, with, with in groups and uh, and and I guess I would say even by myself when I'm feeling really punky and then I uh, one of the things you write you write is that you you know, put on music and I liked that whole thing. So what happens in our brains when we're broadcasting happiness? What happens in our brains? Oh, it's remarkable to see the change. I mean, even neuroscientists are even able to see it on 
brain scans. Your brain lights up differently. Um, when we're in an optimistic mindset, we what we're doing is we're expecting good things to happen. We believe our behavior matters. So we're taking a more active role in what is going on around us. We're more connected. We're more positive. I mean, there's been significant research that shows that when you're in a more optimistic mindset, you're also, quote, unquote, luckier. But luck is just really seeing opportunities and being able to seize them as they're happening. They've been able to find that people who are more optimistic, their eyes track differently their surroundings. They're Mm. actually physically able. I know it's amazing Mm. to see all this. And so then when you broadcast that to other people, then we influence them through our verbals and also our nonverbals, like tone of voice or how we're sitting. There's a fascinating study that was done at the University of California, Riverside, that found that when you take three people who are strangers, put them in a room and have them just sit there with each other for just two minutes in silence, that the person who is most non-verbally expressive uh, is actually influencing the other two people. So if that person has their arms crossed and, you know, a scowl on their face or looks otherwise negative, they actually make the other two people feel less good. Mm. Meanwhile, if they're more positive, they're sitting relaxed, maybe they're smiling, they make other people feel better and their mood improves. So what that tells me is that, and and this is just one small study amongst many, many others that shows that we're transforming other people all the time. Are we using that power for good? And and how can that power be leveraged in our companies, in our classrooms, and with our children? So, so, you know, I'm thinking about what you're saying, and and we've all had that experience when when, when we're in a room and somebody comes in and just, it's like, Remember that little Abner uh, cartoon that, that had where the guy came in and he had like the rain was always coming on top of him? <laughs> like, like somebody walks into the room and it's like a, a, a pallor comes over the room, you know? Yep. And, and then on the other side of that, you have somebody who comes in and they're sort of bouncing in and, they're, and you just want to talk to them. Yes, and, and researchers now are able to track the influence that those key players can have in the room. Mm. Um, and there's been phenomenal research done by Marcio Lasada. He, he studies high performance business teams, and he was he found that uh, through a study where he asked people to work on in groups on strategic plans, and you know, kind of, and he gave them a limited amount of time, so to sort of create a high stress I- experience, um, that the the teams that had uh, what he called a, a higher positivity ratio actually did better. So mm-hmm. in this case, a positivity ratio of six positive comments or in, 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 you know questions to ask and understand someone else's viewpoint versus uh, one negative one or you know a comment that just sort of stops conversation. The, the, the teams that were doing exceptionally well and had the best results in the end were the ones that had a positivity ratio of 6 to 1. The mid-performers were 2 to 1, and the low-performing teams had a positivity ratio of 1 to 1. So if we have someone in our meetings or sitting around the dinner table that's always kind of wah, wah, you know, saying that negative comment, that, that actually stops conversations it, it, or it takes it into negative territory. And then depending on what you're tracking, you can see the results. Yeah, you know, Michelle, those are the ones I'd like to see going going up, you know, those new planets that NASA found, those Trappist ones. They could go there, you know, <laughs> <laughs> because, because that would be a place that they, they would have so much to complain about that, you know, they would be at home, whereas they wouldn't be in my space. <laughs> I, when I give uh, talks at companies, people will say, you know, okay, I, I know the question that's always lingering in their minds in the first, you know, few minutes as I'm bringing up this topic, and they're, they're asking me, well, how do I deal with that? That negative person, he's in the meetings, and he opens his mouth, and it just brings everybody down. And um, the good thing is science is on your side. If you start broadcasting a new mindset yourself, you actually can drown out the negativity of other people. Mm. So, so listen, if I'm not feeling very happy or if I'm struggling and, I, you know, I'm one of those people who feels like everybody's against me, mm-hmm. you say I can turn that around. Well, what can I do differently? Okay, well, so there's two things. First of all, you can do a, a positive habit that we recommend first and foremost for everybody who just wants to um, see a, an uptick in their levels of happiness on a regular basis. Um, I absolutely believe, and through the, and I've seen through the power of research, is 
that when you do your gratitudes every morning or every evening, that can transform your mindset. Hmm. So specifically, the way we recommend it is to do write down three new and unique things you're grateful for each day for 21 days to start. That's just a nice amount of time to feel the effects, to start a life habit. Uh, And the key is new and unique, so your brain is constantly scanning for new things. The reason this is powerful is not only in the moment as you're doing it does it make your brain jump off whatever track it might be on and get it to see other positive things, but also you're then training your brain through the rest of the day to catalog those things, and it helps you see life differently. Um, And then I always recommend involving other people. So whether it be, you know, talking about a positive topic or it's uh, talking about things you're grateful for, uh, you know, connecting with a friend through coffee, get other people involved. Um, Some of the best examples I've seen is, you know, this one woman worked in a government building and she said everyone was very negative and uh, she, you know, liked the idea of gratitude. So she posted a gratitude board in her office in a common place, put some markers there and some post-it notes, and then wrote at the top, what are you grateful for today? And she said it was amazing. First of all, the board was still full in about two or three days. And secondly, oh, nice. yeah, and then people would grab their cup of coffee and stand around and read other people's gratitude. Oh, so that was um, fuel in the fire. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So it became this communal space and people could connect there and connect over positive topics. I love that. I love that idea of a gratitude board. And I, th- and I think it was uh, that I was reading in your book that, uh, uh, that grace before meals, if you say grace before meals, and then do it like a gratitude, uh, like what are you grateful for, like before you start dinner, like just to take a minute to do that. Yes, and I have to share with you this story because I absolutely love this, and this is not in the book because we learned about this afterwards, but there was a guy that we worked with. He sold his company for $100 million, and you would think that he would be on cloud nine. This would be the start of the rest of his life, right? Mm -hmm. Um, It turned out that at 2 in the morning he had uh, an anxiety attack, and the reason being he did not have a relationship with his children because he'd been working so hard on the business. He was convinced that his wife was going to divorce him, and the business had been a fast food business. He'd eaten too many of his own sandwiches, so mm-hmm. he was very overweight. Um, and so his wife turned to him and said, Honey, I'm not going to divorce you, at least not tonight. What I would like to do is please put your sneakers on, let's go for a walk, and let's talk about what we're grateful for. And so he said that first night it was actually hard to talk about what he was grateful for than to walk around the track, even though that was difficult because he was so out of shape. Um, And so they did it. He felt a little better. They kept up the practice. You know, they would go each night. And after about two weeks, he said, I'm feeling just so much better. I'm feeling Hmm. more connected to you. I've got this great idea. Let's bring this to the dinner table and force our daughters to participate. (laughs) And so his wife's like, oh, gosh. Yeah, when you're a parent, you can make kids do stuff. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Like every parent laughs at at the idea of forcing. Uh, So his wife said, okay, well, why don't we just introduce it to the dinner table? And so, of course, the 5-year-old thought it was cute. The 13-year-old rolled her eyes, did not want to have anything to do with it. So the parents said, you know, we'll model it. And they decided to do their gratitude at the beginning beginning of dinner. Now, two weeks later, he gets a call from another father at the school, and he says, the father says, I have to tell you what your daughter did at the sleepover the other night. And he said, oh, no, boys, is Mm -hmm. it drinking? Mm -hmm. And he said, uh, so the other father says, so your daughter felt like the girls were being exceptionally mean with one another at school recently. So at the sleepover, she had all the girls sit down in a circle and go around saying nice things about one another. Huh. Amazing. It is amazing. To me, that just shows the ripple effect Mm -hmm. of of what, you know, your positive behavior can uh, influence other people to do. Very nice. And Michelle, I know you understand this. We have to take a break. So yeah. we're going to go away. We're going away for a couple minutes. Everybody stay close and we'll be back with Michelle Gillen and we'll be talking more about broadcasting happiness. You're listening to the Friday Happy Hour. Hi, this is Anne Marie Kelly, author, victory strategist, and the radio show host of the Friday Happy Hour. I trust you're enjoying my conversation with this fabulous, victorious woman. If you're getting inspired with ideas and feeling empowered, this is just the tip of the iceberg. There's more for you. Tips, downloads, resources at the Victorious Woman Project. 
go to victoriouswoman.com and look around and get on my mailing list so you can be the first to know about the newest good things I have for you. That's www.victoriouswoman.com. Welcome back to the Friday Happy Hour. I'm Anne Marie Kelly, and I'm here with Michelle Gellin, and we're talking about broadcasting happiness. And so, Michelle, some of the things that you were talking about in broadcasting, that you've heard about in broadcasting happiness, um, and this particular one I was interested in, you talked about the predictors, the three predictors of success. Yes. So, and what are they? So it's uh, optimism. Uh, the uh, levels of positive engagement, which is basically your story about stress and then support provision. So in a nutshell, it's uh, optimism is do you believe good things will happen? Do you believe your behavior matters? Positive engagement, it's your story about stress. And when you start getting stressed, do you view it as a threat or do you view it as a challenge? Like, for instance, if you're about to hit a deadline, do you feel ready and you're going to do it and overcome it and hit your deadline? And uh, support provision was fascinating. Instead of knowing how supportive the people are around you and how that predicts your success, this looks at how supportive you are of the people around you, especially in a work context, and then how that can actually predict your success significantly higher. And taking together those three things at, at work predict 75% of your long-term job successes, but you can absolutely see them at play in our romantic relationships and in our families, too. I, and when I was look, looking at that, Michelle, I was thinking about somebody I know in a networking group I belong to, and and she's always looking for that support from other people. But I started to notice maybe in the last six months people are saying to me, you know, she's not, it's not a two-way street. And, mm. and I thought, uh, I, and I felt, and it's somebody, that, and I like this particular person, but I started to notice that it, yeah, it isn't a two-way street. It's always like, here's what I'm doing. And, you know, like, can you help with this? Or, you know, it's, it's always about, hmm, she's not, inv she's investing in herself, but she's not investing in others. And I was thinking about that. And I, I think sometimes we don't think that that is a success, uh, puts you on a success track when you're helping other people. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I think a lot of people feel as if uh, they feel worried, uh, whether they're like your friend or they're or they're a little bit more giving, is they, they sort of worry, am I going to get taken advantage of? Um, and so what we find is, yes, there are some people that are so far on the spectrum of supporting everyone else that they're kind of being walked on. It's like, you know, maybe it's, right. it's like I have felt a little bit like that as a mom of a small child when I haven't gotten a shower in two days, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Mm -hmm. But but uh, but I think though that that's so it's it's only small parts of our lives or, and only a, a slim part of the population. Really, the majority of people uh, try to do a more balanced relationship. I give to you, you give to me. But what we find is that the people who can strategically give in a way that is um, you know it helps it helps the other person, but it's not just fully giving themselves away and not taking care of themselves at the same time. Mm -hmm. That those are actually the people that enjoy the highest levels of long-term success. Hmm. Now, you, talk, you mentioned stress a, a minute ago with the, the positive engagement and the work optimism, and, and here's the thing. This, this is something that I absolutely loved in Broadcasting Happiness, that you say that we can leverage positivity to fuel success, and one of those ways is using flash memories. Mm -hmm. And it, it fascinated me because I think so many times, and I think this is especially tr true with women, we do something and then it's done and we forget about it. Mm -hmm. And we don't, uh, for me, it's with in Victorious Woman, I say, well, write down your victories so that when you're feeling bummed out that you can go back and look at them. But you're talking about using these flash memories. What is a flash memory? Flash memory is the first thing that you think about when a topic or a person or a, a situation comes up. So, like, if I were to say to you, you know, New York, you could, you know, New York City, could you, you might think of tall buildings, you might think of yellow cabs, you might think of rats, depending on what your perception of the city is. Mm -hmm. I think awesome. I love New York. Yeah. Uh, but uh, really what this is about is our, our own self-concept or the self-concept that people have themselves. And when we can change people's flash memories, their first thought, is it 
do I think I'm a success? Do I think I'm victorious? Do I think I'm achieving things that I want to do? Do I think I'm kind? When those are positive self-concepts, then it changes how we interact with other people. Um, so I love that you write down what you've been victorious at. That is the number one recommendation I make to people when they're feeling stressed and stuck and not as if they can move forward. Write down five situations in your past that you have been victorious over and, you know, you have, it was something big, it was something stressful, but you overcame it and you did a great job. And then the next time that you feel stressed, whip out that list because that list is full of facts, full of facts that are fueling facts that can help show your brain another picture so that you can then feel calmer and move forward. Mm -hmm. And I think that's great because I think that we, we all too many times don't give ourselves the credit that we have worked for, that we deserve. And then when we get into a situation, it's, it's like, and I don't know if you have figured this out in your research yet, Michelle, but why, why our brains always go back to the negative? If we don't have enough positive stuff fueling it, like with these flash memories, that our brains tend to go to the negative. Yeah, there's a very strong negativity bias that we all have. Uh, some of us can help it, and and if we you know are conscious of it and practice looking more to the positive. Now, listen, negativity bias in the beginning was really good, right? It was a survival thing. I need to know about the negatives and the threats in my environment in order to. Right. You know, to survive. Mm. But these days when life is significantly safer, things are in general okay. If our brain is constantly on high alert or constantly focused on the negative or stresses, we're actually not allowing our brains to leverage all the good things. Um, and that's why the practice of gratitude or talking to other people about things that are going well or complimenting other people, those are all actually really fueling for our brain and help train it to start more um, regularly focusing on the good. Uh, one of the things in the in the books that I'm just finishing now, uh, uh, one of the things that I, it's one of the recommendations I make to couples is w that you sit down and say what's working and what's not working and start out with the what's working thing, which I think in your book you call power leads. Mm-hmm. That yeah, you... <laughs> um, that is so important. It's, so I've, I've studied the influence of the first few words on a conversation can have on the trajectory of the conversation. And so, you know, we mentioned meetings before. If someone starts off negative, it only goes downhill from there. Or your mm -hmm. friend greets you for coffee and they're being really negative. Sometimes we can feel that the only two options are to express compassion for what they're going through or to play misery poker. Oh, you think that's me? It was bad. Let me tell you about mine. Yeah, really. Um, <laughs> And so, but I, but when we start off with something positive and meaningful, which I call the power lead, lead your conversations with something positive, meaningful to your life or meaningful to the other person, then it opens up the door for the other people, person to talk about something good in their life. You know, how are you doing? Oh, I'm doing great. I had breakfast with my son this morning. He's being so cute. Oh, that's awesome. Let me tell you about the good in my mm -hmm. life. And the conversation goes in a different direction. I noticed that with my spouse that if we if 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 we start a, a meeting, I call them family meetings. If we start a family meeting, and and I'm like, and you didn't do it, uh, uh, <laughs> the meeting goes downhill in seconds. Mm -hmm. You know, it lasts it, it lasts next to no time because it wasn't worth. It was just like a dumb way to start a meeting. <laughs> Versus it's like, you know, it was really nice that you did this for me this week, and I really appreciate, appreciated that. And then the meeting gets off on a better footing. So yeah. when you do get to the stuff that's like, and, you know, that stuff, it's it, the person that you're talking to doesn't see it as a threat yes. or a criticism. And I love the story that you just shared because it's it's the human side of, of the research, right? I mean, we it, it's it's great to kind of poke fun at ourselves and then also to realize that we can transform, we can try new things, we can experiment like scientists and see what works. So when we start our, our family meeting the next time, maybe by sharing a joke or talking about some cool thing that we're going to be doing, and then we can go into the other stuff. But how, how that, you know, we can see how what kind of role that plays in, in our relationship and in our happiness, ultimately. Mm -hmm. Michelle, we have to take another break, but I want to tell uh, my listeners that when we come back, what I'd like to talk with you about is uh, Dr. 
uh, Ellen Langer's study with the 75-year-old men because it was, right. I think it was one of my favorite things in broadcasting happiness. So everybody stay close and hang in there, and we'll be right back. You're listening to the Friday Happy Hour. Are you one of those women who lived the first part of your life as a really good girl? That is, you did all the right things and followed all the so-called rules for women. I was like that, too. But have you noticed that once you passed 40, you have less patience for those rules? Maybe you even think that the rules really don't make sense for you anymore. Maybe they never did, and you just didn't realize it. Do you want to go where other recovering good girls meet to inspire each other and support their new, empowered selves? Then join me, Anne-Marie Kelly, and some very fabulous Victorious Women. We're on Facebook at The Victorious Woman Project. So go to facebook.com forward slash Victorious Woman Project. I'll talk to you there. Welcome back to the Friday Happy Hour. I'm Anne-Marie Kelly, and I'm here with best-selling author of Broadcasting Happiness, Michelle Gellin. And Michelle, I... I, I would love for you to tell that story about the about Dr. Langer's research about the 75-year-old men. I, this is one of my favorite research studies on the power of mindset. What Dr. Ellen Langer from Harvard did was she asked 75-year-old men who um, to come to a retreat center and spend a week there. And the whole time, the idea was to get them to feel as if they were 55 years young. So she had her research team make name badges with pictures from them looking 20 years earlier. She, uh, they cleared out the retreat center of anything that would make you think of what year it was actually. And there were, you know, Saturday evening posts and newspapers and magazines from 20 years prior. And the idea was that they were only supposed to talk about topics from that, that year. Uh, anyway, she tested them before and after this experience. And what she found was that there were a number of physical measures that changed, like people felt more energized. They felt um, as if their health had improved. They felt, you know, just all these different things. But the, the thing that blew my mind was that even something as, uh, you know, as, as one way as eyesight, right, it only decreases. On average, their eyesight improved by 10% over the course of that, that week. Was am- I read that and I was amazed. I know. I said something physical like that could change. Yeah, and it was, it shows us how when we think we're younger, we act younger, it actually improves our body. Oh, and the best part was that they had naive raters, these people who didn't know these older men, uh, rate how old they thought the pictures of these guys were from, from that time, right? And what they found was they rated them on average looking three years younger than they actually were. Wow. So it made you look more attractive and younger. That's, it's amazing. I, I, I have to tell you, I sent, after reading that in Broadcasting Happiness, I emailed my alums that I get together with, I get my high school alums, and, and they know that I don't tell the truth about what year I graduated or what, <laughs> or how old I am. And, and I said, you all think I'm nuts, but there's a method to, there's science to back up what I do. <laughs> There is. There you go. <laughs> you know, and then I, so I totally embraced it, especially like on those times when I still have, and I'll bet you every listener can, can identify with this. There's like a 22-year-old still lurking someplace in my brain, you know, and sometimes I have to let her out. You know? Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, I'm. I'm in my. I say I'm in my mid thirties. I might not be. I might be a little more than that. But I actually, I'm not even kidding you. I cannot remember how old I am because for so long, my husband and I both were saying, "Oh, we're 28. We're 28." Mm-hmm. And it just felt like a good age. We just, we just said we were, and now I can't remember. <laughs> and see, it's, it works. It's a good thing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, so you, I think you heard me talking about Judy Dench, and she's 82. Mm-hmm. And she yeah. and her new movie's just coming out. What kind of a, a broadcasting happiness mindset do you think she might have? I think she has to have just one of those. She's going to be one of those positive outlier cases that's like she's young, she's empowered, she's just got it. And it translates into to the energy that she brings to her projects. And I have to say, I would guess it also allows her to be a, offered more roles than uh, than otherwise would have, right? Because if she carried herself in an older fashion, people might not think of her as often. And, and you know, you're absolutely right. I remember seeing her in the uh, the, the first uh, Best Exotic Marigold Hotel movie, and mm-hmm. uh, and I thought, well, she moves like a 
I mean, she moves. Uh, my spouse is a massage therapist, so he really pays attention to things like movement and posture and, and whatever. And I, so I've learned to, so I look at it now because he's always pointing it out. And uh, she moved like a young girl. Yeah. And I yeah. and I thought that was really neat. And even her character in that movie that she, she put herself out past like some of what her other retiree uh, guests at that hotel were doing. It was, but she's just that, I think that she's just that way. You know, when you. Yeah, I mean, I'm wondering if she does a lot of yoga because I feel like yoga is what keeps you limber and feeling mm. young and feeling good. And mm. I, I, I try to show up to my classes as often as I can. Yeah. I, I hear you. I know what you're saying. Um, uh, now, there's something else, Michelle, that you write about, and it's, and it's stress. And, you know, all of us experience stress, and it can be so physically debilitating and, you know, emotionally paralyzing. And,. You know, sometimes when you have to make a, a decision and you're stressed and, and you get kind of stuck. But in Broadcasting Happiness, you write that we can use something called a fueling fact to, mm-hmm. to shift out of stress. So what's a fueling fact and how do we find them? Fueling facts are facts that are equally true to what your brain might be currently focusing on, but they are uh, they fuel us and they help us ca- calm down and and then move forward. So you know, uh, oftentimes what happens is our, our brains are incredible processors. We can see in our environment forty to sixty bits of information, but we're bombarded by more than eleven million bits of information. Mm. Wow. So that's why we we can walk out of a coffee shop and we might see you know the nice car driving down the street and the sunshine, but we don't notice our our, our ex-husband sitting at the coffee table mm-hmm. right outside, mm-hmm. right? It's because we can't pay attention to everything. And the same is with feeling facts. Sometimes with, when we're in a stressful situation, our brain gets so focused on the negative. Uh, you know, our self-talk is in this stressed place where we're ruminating over what happened or what's going to happen, and we're in fear. And by asking ourselves to see successes we've had previously, the strengths that we have, the skills that we can leverage, the relationships we can connect to, those things will all help our brain get off that neural track of of stress and anxiety and just see another picture. We don't have to disprove the original picture. We just have to open up the possibility to this new picture based on facts, and then that can help us feel calmer and ready to take an action step. Hmm. And I can see it. It's it's like it's like when you think I can, I can, I can, and then somebody shows you how. And then it's like, oh, I can. Yeah, and and one big thing to think about next time, you know, if we're feeling overwhelmed and stressed, is we always advocate, and we've done a new research study since the book was published, actually, looking at this, is you don't have to solve the whole problem right now. You just have to get your brain moving forward, and the way you can do that is by picking a now step. It's a, a small, concrete action that you can do right now that will help move you towards the solution, but it doesn't have to solve the whole, whole problem, right? Like, mm-hmm. save $3.00 if you need to buy a new car as opposed to being like, oh, I need to go back and get my master's and get a new job and get a you know, higher pay to buy a new car. No, just like save three bucks, buy a small coffee instead of a large one, and at least that shows your brain potential for moving forward. Mm. Now, Michelle, it's, you, I'm sure you listen to the news, and you know that since the uh, November's election, we're hearing so much negativity, and it's so acrimonious, and it's scary. If Mm -hmm. if we're all broadcasters, how do you think that's affecting our society? And could it be affecting that? I know that's the big picture and it's the administration, whatever. But how how could it be affecting our everyday life and productivity? Do you think it is? Uh, Absolutely, without a doubt. I think that when our brains are too full of not so much negative news, but news that makes us feel disempowered, we are, that can transfer over to our work days, to our family life, mm. et cetera. Um, and actually, we'd, we've been able to quantify it. So we ran a study. This is with my husband and fellow researcher, Sean Acor, and in partnership with Ariana Huffington. We found that just three minutes of negative news in the morning can lead to a 27% higher likelihood of you reporting a bad day as reported six to eight hours later. So that negative wow. mood and mindset, yeah, I know. It's like, it's mind blowing when you wow. think, oh, I just got caught up on the news for three minutes, and now look at how this sticks with me through the course of my day. Now, mm. here's the here's one thing though. There is so people say, okay, well then I'm just not going to 
you know, listen to the news or watch it or anything, you can actually stay informed without getting depressed. The key is to protect yourself from purely negative problem-focused stories and seek out inspiring or solutions-focused stories. Talk about a problem, find a solution. Get your brain focused on what you can do about it because then that helps lead to, uh, you know, feeling a greater sense of hope and purpose and meaning as opposed to just feeling helpless and hopeless. And so, and too much of that, is, and that happens too many times where it's like, oh, and all the news is bad, and oh my God, what's going to happen? But, but you're thinking that if you go and here's the problem and I can find a solution and you find those kinds of stories, and they are out there. Yeah, absolutely. And listen, there are some stories that, there's little to nothing we can do, right? Mm-hmm. They just, they, it was a, a random act of that. It happened. It was horrible. And, but the vast majority of stories, we can raise awareness. We can donate. We can get other people to get involved in, in the situation. You know, there's all kinds of things that we can do. And it's not to say you have to take action on every story, but you just need to show your brain that there's another path. And then for the causes that you truly care about, Get involved. Have your one thing that's your passion. Mm. Um, I love the other day I saw Liz Gilbert, the author of E Pray Love. She said on her Facebook page, I am no longer talking about merely problems. If I discuss a problem, I'm going to talk about a solution. And so here's the problem I want to talk about, and here's what I want you guys to do about it. So, but it was great because it doesn't just leave your mind saying, oh, life is depressing, everything's awful. It says, hey, there's hope. Yeah, when you think you have, you can do something about it, then you put yourself back in control. Yes, and control is a huge predictor of happiness. Right. Michelle, we're out of time, and this was so much fun. Thank you so much for joining us on today's Happy Hour. Thank you for having me. And if you, there's so much more information, so you can get Michelle's book. If you go to the radio wrap-up at victoriouswoman.com, there's a link to her book and a link to her website. And there's an assessment. I love assessments, Michelle, and I took the one on your website. Oh, great. Yeah, Wonderful. It yeah. yeah, broadcastinghappiness.com. It's all there. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much. Have a great weekend. Too. Thank you. And so you victory chicks and guys, uh, if you're doing anything, this is a great weekend to get out. And I was thinking about you can drive down the shore, you can go. And Newcastle, Delaware is not that far. And it's a national park. So that's a good place to go. Uh, I want to leave you with a quote from Judy Dench since I was talking about her a lot today. And somebody asked her about retirement and if she felt fulfilled. And, I, you know, I can almost hear that gravelly voice of hers giving this indignant answer about being fulfilled. And she said, no, 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 I hope not. Being fulfilled is closing the drawer, and I don't want to do that just yet. I'd bore myself silly. I wouldn't learn anything new. Now, Victory Chicks, new guys, is that broadcasting happiness? Is that a broadcasting happiness kind of mindset or what? It's the mindset for me. I hope it's the mindset for you. Thanks for coming to Happy Hour today. Please come back next week. I'll talk to you then. Chen Zan. Thanks for listening to this Friday Happy Hour. Make sure you subscribe, rate, and review today's show. And join us again next week for the Friday Happy Hour with Anne-Marie Kelly.